According to the report released by the Urban Institute, the average pimp in Atlanta brings home $33,000 a week and has five or six girls that he handles is how they term that. So if you if you factor all that in and you start calculating, the average sex act can be purchased for 100 bucks in Atlanta. If he's got five girls and he's making home $33,000 a week, that means those girls are being forced into 60 to 65 sex acts a, a week. Obviously, that's a violation of everything that's right. And so, uh, you know, here at City of Refuges, one of our big focuses is to try and remedy that, do something about that. That's Bruce Deal, the founder and CEO of City of Refuge in Atlanta, Georgia, an organization that takes on some of our toughest challenges, from sex trafficking to homelessness to addiction. They're located in urban Atlanta's west side in the city's most dangerous neighborhood, nicknamed The Bluff. Highest crime rate in the state per capita. Highest HIV rate. Highest homelessness rate. 60% of murders in Atlanta happen here. Here's more from Bruce. It depends on the reports that you read, but Atlanta ranks uh, one, two, or three in most reports as it relates to the number of sex trafficking incidents every month in the United States. So 12,400 cash for sex transactions in the state of Georgia every month, the majority of those in metro Atlanta. And so what happens is there are a lot of individuals, a lot of young girls and, and young adult women who find themselves either economically challenged, they have some mental challenge, they have an addiction issue, they have a family crisis, and they find themselves being exploited by somebody who offers them housing or the drug of choice or uh, care for their children. And so it begins sort of as, as an exploitation and then often moves into more of a trafficking issue. And the trafficking does not necessarily mean that they're, they're locked down. It just means that their life circumstance holds them captive. And the way that they're able to feed their kids, the way they're able to have housing or have their drug of choice is through the sexual activity that takes place. In other words, Atlanta has a huge sex trafficking problem, but it also has City of Refuge, where Bruce, his staff, and his volunteers are taking on this problem, and many others, head on. This is Crazy Good Turns. We tell stories about people who do amazing things for others. I'm your host, Brad Shaw. Today we'll get to know City of Refuge and the incredible man behind its birth and growth. City of Refuge is a 200,000 square foot warehouse on an eight acre tract on Joseph E. Boone Boulevard. Where good works is the tagline. The facility includes housing for 250 women and children, a dining hall, a gym, a workout center, a 10,000 square foot medical clinic, a private school for middle and high schoolers, an after school auto skills training center, a safe house, a teen pregnancy home, and a church. Hundreds, thousands of lives have been turned around here. But it wasn't always like this. So let's go back to the beginning, 1997. Well, yeah, and so, you know, like I said, we lived in suburbs, had a great home. But I literally lived across the street from our girls' school. Uh, they were seven, five, three, and one at the time, so the seven to five-year-olds went to school. And, and my wife would pull them across the street in a little red wagon in the morning and go back and get them in the evening. So we just had this idealistic sort of Mayberry life. Well, I had been in what I call traditional ministry for about 14 years, so had served on church staffs as a youth pastor and associate pastor, those kind of things. And I was invited to go downtown on a six-month consulting assignment to oversee the potential closing and selling of a little church that most of the folks had moved to the suburbs and the church was down to about 20 folks and no money and building in disrepair. So our fifth or sixth Sunday, uh, leading the little church that we thought we were going to close, uh, at the, right after service had started a Sunday morning, I was up front and uh, we're about to have a couple songs and a young lady walked in the back door and she looked sort of disheveled, looked like she hadn't slept all night, obviously stood out in a crowd because there were only about 20 folks there. And uh, she sat about halfway up on the right and, uh, and we went through the regular service and she seemed to be weeping most of that service and really at a place of turmoil in her life. And as we got to the end of the service, I wrapped up, we had a closing prayer and she just stepped immediately out into the uh, center aisle, tears were streaming down her face and she just walked straight to me. And uh, she reached out both hands and took me by the hands and she said, my name's Carolyn. I've been a hooker and a stripper 14 years. Can you help me? Bruce did help Carolyn. He took her in, gave her shelter and hope, and put her on the road to recovery from the tragic life she was living. 
She showed up the next week with one of her Johns, an alcoholic looking for help too. Soon word spread throughout the community and each Sunday when Bruce and his wife Rhonda came to the church, more and more desperate, broken people showed up seeking their help. Yeah, so about four months in, I walk in on a Sunday morning, Rhonda's with me and literally there are a hundred people in crisis sitting in the sanctuary. Prostitutes, homeless folk, people running from the law, alcoholics, and they're just all looking at us and just with the look of, can you help us? And they've invited each other, strangest thing. And so, you know, I drew on my deep theological seminary training. I looked at Ron and I just said, we've been conned by God, right? Because we had no intention of starting an inner city organization, inner city ministry. And so after that service, we went to lunch and we just looked at each other and said, what re- what's really going on here? We're supposed to be down here for six months. We've got this life and safe environment and great schools and homes. And and at that lunch, after that Sunday morning with the hundred folks sitting there, we just said, we're supposed to do this. It it wasn't, it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't earth moving. It was just this settledness in our spirits and in our hearts and our minds and looking at each other. This is our destiny. It's what we're supposed to do. But here's the thing. Bruce and Rhonda didn't just start City of Refuge. It became their life, literally. They left their comfortable home in the suburbs and moved themselves and their four daughters into the third floor of the church. They started taking people in men, women, and children out on the street, providing help, feeding the homeless, helping the addicted get treatment, putting broken people back together. But let's pause here. Bruce moved his family to one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city. His wife, four daughters, and eventually their fifth, were literally living in the same building with felons, prostitutes, drug addicts, and alcoholics. My kids went to a, a really high-end private Christian school in Atlanta, and, uh, and so they were getting the best of both worlds, a great education and great cultural experiences, and then coming home to this other world. And so they would invite friends over, and because the parents had met Ron and I thought we were sane, they thought, they would let them come. And then when they would come to pick them up, all of a sudden they would go, my child's been here. <laughs> you know, there are burglar bars on the building, three alarm systems to get in. And, and so they had a lot of play dates that were one-time play dates. They did this for six years, with crack addicts sleeping on the porch, Bruce says. Homeless sleeping under the church baptistry. Some they tried to help, others tried to take. Countless break-ins, three cars stolen. Guns, knives, fist fights in the parking lot. I elected not to have a, a firearm. I elected just to have a baseball bat under my bed. And so she has watched me pick that baseball bat in my underwear and start running down the street chasing guys that are stealing stuff. And, and for the most part, it got to the point that it wasn't offensive to me, but it was humorous to the fact that she would just laugh sometimes. I mean, I'm in the middle of chasing somebody down the street, and she's just laughing like, you forgot your pants, you know. Uh, and the girl, so it, it, it almost got to the point where sometimes we didn't even realize the level of danger that we were involved in. And so I don't remember being afraid. I do remember walking away from some situations, shaking my hand, well, man, I could have really been bad, you know, yes. after the fact. Bruce tells the story of one man named Michael who had been staying at the church's men's shelter and had had a conflict with one of his staff and was dismissed from the shelter. The man called and left violent, threatening voicemails on Bruce's office and cell phones. Bruce is obviously a tough guy, not easily shaken, but this was different. Michael showed up one day and asked to see Bruce, who led him back to his office. They talked, and Michael pleaded to be let back into the shelter, but Bruce told him his behavior was unacceptable and that just wasn't going to happen. They made their way out to the parking lot, and Bruce thought Michael had left when someone yelled for him to watch out as Michael charged around the corner of the building, about to swing a cinder block to bash Bruce's head in. Bruce charged him and wrestled the block from his hands, but it didn't end there. His threat then was, you know, I'm going to kill you. And so he started describing how he would do that, but then where it moved for me was he started describing how he's gonna kill Rhonda and the girls. And so he told me what time Rhonda left in the morning for school and what time she returned in the evening and how he would shoot her and how he would take each child. It was just different. You know, I deal with a lot of angry people and I've dealt with a lot of, of uh, violent people, but there was something different and it was a mental health challenge, I'm, I'm sure. And so he says, matter of fact, I think I'll just do that now. And so he left and, and one of the very few times in my 18 years that I've ever called the cops, I actually dialed 911. And literally, as the cops pulled to the parking lot, Michael came back around the corner with a gun. And so they arrested him, took him to court, and that's... uh, The life that Bruce uh, describes uh, would terrify most. But what's incredible is how calm he is about it all, like it's just a normal part of his job. And he finds joy and humor in much of it. He talks about the girls swimming in the baptismal and repelling from the church balcony. And he laughs at some of the less threatening criminal interactions he's had. 
Well, we, you know, we moved in the first night, actually, that we lived there. A man that would, uh, was high on crack, I'm assuming, tried to steal our van. And, uh, but because of his sort of distorted mental state, he hot-wired the windshield wiper motor. And we came out the next morning, the van's still there, and the wipers are going. <laughs> so you might be asking why. Why do this? There are plenty of other do-gooders out there, without kids, willing to sacrifice time, energy, their safety. Why put your family, your kids, in danger to save others? Did you ever have someone say, a friend or family member, just ask, what, what are you thinking? I mean, putting your daughters and whole family in, in this kind of situation. I had that question asked a hundred times in I the bet. first year. I, I mean, bet. family members, friends, ministry partners all said this is a bad decision. And what was your answer? Well, my answer was it's what I'm supposed to do. You know, and so they said this is a bad decision uh, career-wise. You know, I, we, we had some great opportunities that, from a fleshly perspective, were the right things to do, promotions within the denomination I'm a part of. Uh, so folks who said this is a bad career move, you're taking a little church with 20 folks, you're starting a nonprofit, you'll be forgotten. So that was one thing. The, the safety issue was another big thing. You just can't take your girls to this environment. Uh, we just block out the negative voices. And I don't think we ever regretted it. Uh, you know, we, we had some conversations where we're like, you know, is this good for our girls or not as good for our girls? Is this, you know, the best thing we should be doing? But we, we really felt like it was providential. We really felt like this was our destiny in life. And so since we were so confident of that. Bruce is thoughtful really and intentional and has gone through the mental process of weighing the risk against the reward. It's clear that he and his family get as much as they give through their good works. And that's well worth the risk to them. When you think about success or you think about things that are that affirm us or warm our spirits, I think about Vanessa, for instance, that I met at a feeding line. We, we feed the homeless out of, at a liquor store every Sunday morning. Started 18 years ago. Been doing that ever since. And I met Vanessa. And Vanessa uh, just looked at me across from the feeding table and said, can I go home with you? I'd never seen Vanessa before. And, and, and it was a really challenging question, but I said yes. So we put her in a car and took her home. And I uh, started listening to her story and finding out what was going on. And Vanessa was sold by her mother when she was 12 years old to a guy down the street for a fifth of liquor. And uh, he began to rape her and she got pregnant at 12 and had a child and defects came in and took her out of the home and the child out of the home. And she was in defects, uh, foster care until she was 19. At 19, she aged out and had no family support, so she went to the streets. And for 20 years, she had been prostitute, homeless, in and out of jail, drug addict, alcoholic. And uh, so we put her in a 12-month in a recovery program that she uh, successfully graduated from. We put her in a 12-month spiritual discipleship program. Found out she had a little bit of mental health challenge. We got her on some disability, and she started volunteering with us. And we got 100 or 200 or 300 of those stories, and that really is what keeps us going. So great. You come into a tough inner city neighborhood, you fight off the bad guys, help hundreds of people get back on their feet. Everyone feels good, right? Well, not exactly. Bruce is a white guy from rural Virginia. Raised on a farm, obviously with a strong southern drawl. What happens when you parachute into an inner city neighborhood that's 98% black, preaching your word and offering to change everything, including the elements of the community's criminal economic ecosystem? And so when I got here, my greatest resistance uh, and the, those who provided the greatest resistance were folks who had been here a long time who did not want the white preacher from the suburbs coming in. Again, I think I was just naive. I just knew it's what I was supposed to do. So I just said, I'm showing up. And all of a sudden, I've got folks who've been in the neighborhood for years who are going, we don't, I mean, literally looking me in the face saying, we don't want you here. I wouldn't back down. My question was, well, why not? And their answer was, because you're white. And so I said, well, there's nothing I can do about that. I just know this is where I'm supposed to be. And so the, the way we resolved that issue, although it would never be completely resolved, but the way we sort of mitigated that issue, we just continued to do good work over and over and over, over and over and over, over and over and over. And that good work continues today. Six years ago, Bruce and his family and City of Refuge moved from the church to their current location, that 200,000 square foot warehouse in the most dangerous neighborhood in all of Georgia. They're putting the finishing touches on a loft apartment in the facility where Bruce and his family will live. Some of the girls are grown and married with their own lives now, but all are still involved with City of Refuge in some way. Like Bruce, it's just part of their lives now. 
winding back to that first prostitute that came in at the mission church, do you know where she is now and what's happened to her? I do. Yeah, we've kept in touch with her. She lives in South Carolina now. She's married, very stable, great job, um, you know, kids now. And so, you know, when we look back, she had this really rough stretch of 14 years in her life that sort of started getting better when she walked in the door of that little church. And uh, and now 18 years later is a, is a huge success story of, of City of Refuge. I can't say I know Bruce Deal well. I've only met him two or three times, but from what I've seen, he's a classic study in contrast. A white Southern farm boy choosing to live in a black urban ghetto. Someone who can rattle off stats about pimps and the price of a sex act in one breath and quote scripture in the next. A loving husband and father intentionally putting his family into dangerous situations most other men wouldn't dare. A guy so tough he's almost intimidating in person, but has the biggest heart I've ever seen and a true compassion for his fellow man. Someone living among the most tragic of human consequences, but finding humor and joy in it all. Bruce is an evolved, complex person, all gray in a polarized world of black and white. You know, people who start nonprofits, like Bruce, do it because something breaks their heart. A group of people in dire need, a cause no one else seems to care about. That first prostitute in Bruce's church broke his heart. But people who start nonprofits also have a bottomless well of hope. Despite all the bad in the world that they're trying to fix and all the odds against them, they think and hope they can actually make a difference. And they do. I've got two last questions. First, Bruce, what breaks your heart? You know, a lot of things break my heart. And I think to sum it up, the thing that breaks my heart the most at this point in my life after leading City Refuge 18 years is that the need that exists in our world as it relates to poverty, lack of quality education for too many folks, lack of vocational opportunities for too many folks, and domestic violence and sex trafficking. The fact that those issues are as great today as they have ever been in the history of our nation breaks my heart. It's sad that we still face challenges that we faced in 1930 or 1820. And in many respects, the issues are larger because the population base is larger. So the number of folks being challenged by poverty and lack of education and, and violence is higher than it's ever been. And what gives you hope? What gives me hope is that there are a lot of places like City of Refuge. There are people all over the country who have the right heart, the right motive. They're driven by the desire to help somebody else. The next generation coming really gives me hope. The 20s and 30s of this day, the millennials are creative, they're passionate, they're driven by justice. And so I'm not dismayed by what's going on because I see the next generation coming up that really seems to have a passion to change what's wrong in our world. I'm Brad Shaw, and thanks for listening to this episode of Crazy Good Turns. Go to crazygoodturns.org to learn more about City of Refuge and submit your ideas for extraordinary people and organizations we should feature. You might have noticed we found some great music to support our podcast, and we've provided a Spotify playlist of the full tracks on our website so you can take a longer listen, which we hope you'll do. And if you're a band with a song we should consider featuring, you can submit it on our website too. Crazy Good Turns is audio engineered by Stephen Key. Music supervision and mixing by ScoreScore in Los Angeles. And a special thanks to Megan Basinger. We hope you like our podcast and help us out by sharing us in your social networks and giving us a review on iTunes. Take care and let's connect again soon. I didn't know the gentleman, never had met him, and I went up to speak to him and I said, Sir, excuse me. I said, but I was here last Sunday and you come across as a visionary. He said, I am. And he said, him and his wife and his family, they live with their hands open. And they are so profoundly blessed and prosperous.